In the 1960s, a disparate group of maverick artists rejected the mainstream art world and instead forged new and experimental approaches to art. Many of them were part of London's burgeoning underground scene and used performance as a forceful way of expressing their disgust at a society based on profit and war. The most exciting galleries on the scene in 1965 were Robert Fraser and Kasmin. But these two thriving young galleries were very much part of the mainstream commercial art market. The first stirrings of radical experimentation were barely beginning in the world of sculpture and didn't really get going for another couple of years. The underground, meanwhile, was urgently looking to find a voice. You could say it sort of all began with the Albert Hall reading in 65, summer of 65, and pretty much ended with the 14-hour technical dream in whenever that was, the end of 67, or the end of the summer of 67. The Albert Hall Poetry Reading was a landmark moment in the mid-60s, organised in an amateurish way by a group of radical young poets and intellectuals. To the astonishment of the organisers, thousands of young people turned up, proving for the first time that there was a significant audience for marginal and offbeat culture. How many people the Albert Hall holds? You know, seven thousand. Seven thousand. And we sort of thought, well, if seven thousand people pay a quid or whatever it was to come to see this kind of poetry reading, which was a complete sort of quite you know, good mess, um, we could probably get, you know, people to come and see, you know, an art sh an art gallery in the bookshop. I met John Dunbar through an American poet called Paolo Leone. John had been looking for uh, premises to start a, an experimental art gallery, and Paolo knew that I was looking for premises to start an experimental bookshop, so he very kindly put the two of us together. John, you were married to... You were married to or going out with Marian Faithful at that point? No, I was married to at that point, yeah. It was magic. It was like a whole doorway opened up into a world that I didn't know. He smoked pot. He was that hip. He knew Burroughs. He knew Alan. That's how I met Alan Ginsberg. And he knew Paul McCartney. And he knew Jane Asher. And he, you know, he knew everybody. When I met Marianne, she had already recorded As Tears Go By and was already famous. And in fact, her, her fame came a bit as a surprise to, to John as well, because uh, he went off on holiday to Greece by himself. And John came back and she had a record in uh, top ten. Nick, Nick was born in November 65. Yeah, so, so I had to do something. I remember there was, we had a meeting or a dinner in Bianchi's, upstairs in Bianchi's, with John, Marianne, myself, Miles, and it was decided to do Indica then. Where we basically agreed that we would get together and change the world and everything, and uh, Marianne was there, but uh, as though she was doing quite well, she very wisely decided not to put any money into this project. She was, you know, busy with her own, with rock and roll at that time. We were both sort of, you know, busy with our own things, really. Please lock me away. the money came from another pop star. It was John Dunbar's close friend Peter Asher from the band Peter and Gordon 
who put up the £2,000 they needed. And rain clouds hide the moon, I'm okay, here I'll stay with my loneliness. I don't care what they say, I won't stay in a world without love. Peter Asher was living at his parents' house in Wimpole Street and also living in his parents' house was uh, his sister Jane. Jane Asher was Paul McCartney's girlfriend and they lived at the Asher's house. Up on, in the top floor in the servants' room, next to Peter's L-shaped room with the Norwegian wood shelving and everything, was this tiny little uh, maid's room where Paul McCartney lived and he stayed for three years, even though he was a multimillionaire by then. We then knew all those people, but we didn't know them because they were rock and roll stars. I don't know if we were even called rock and roll stars then, whatever they were called. We knew them because of art, you know, bookshops and art and those kind of, that kind of connection. And I think that's what they found quite interesting about Miles in particular and Indica, because it was a way into, and Miles was in contact with all the beat poets and all those kind of things in American underground newspapers and magazines. So it was a kind of funny mixture. <laughs> Indica was named after a type of marijuana called cannabis indica. It had its premises in Mason's Yard, a tiny, rather seedy courtyard behind Piccadilly. Can you just tell me what it was like in Mason's Yard when you first moved in? There was a, there was a loo, a gents in that, in the sort of electricity substation took up the whole middle. We had sort of constant entertainment because there were all the little the mini dramas unfolding at the costume. Plus there was this hotel next to us which had kind of weird junky kind of um, kind of kitchen porter type that was in and out. John Dunbar had a degree in art history from Cambridge but knew nothing about the contemporary art market. To help him run Indica, he hired an experienced gallery manager from a commercial gallery in Paris. You moved to London to, in order to come and work at Indica, is that right? Yes, absolutely, yes. And where, can you explain where you lived? The gallery had a basement. I stayed in the basement for a while. <laughs> then I discovered that there was a, a large warehouse on top. And so I moved on top in that large warehouse. But it was not always so easy, because there were, at the time, you know, it was, we were very close to very chic areas, like, you know, the, the Duke Street St. James area, but there was also Piccadilly. And at night, these people were not behaving uh, socially very normally. You know, they could be uh, aggressive and violent. I was attacked a few times, even in the gallery. We were all working on the bookshop, uh, putting up shelves and stuff, and Paul McCartney arrived one day in his Aston Martin and came staggering out with a huge package, and it was wrapping paper that he had designed for the bookshop and gallery. He'd hand-lettered the whole line, it wasn't done with letter set or anything, and had it printed, and of course printed it in on like fine art paper instead of wrapping paper. And it was a, just a wonderful gift, just out of the blue like that. Uh, he, he must have taken hours and hours and hours doing all these letters by hand, because it, it was really well done, actually. <laughs> you know, it's just a straightforward uh, endeavour kind of thing, you know, just to do something. Yeah other than what's been done before, because what's been done before isn't necessarily the answer. We were kind of weird enough to be the only kind of interesting thing around, you know, so the, the journalists and TV and, you know, kind of made it and, you know, made it splash out very quickly, didn't it? Sort of like yeah. unexpectedly. But it helped, of course, that the first proper show there really was the, the, one of the guys won the Venice Biennale yeah. Grand Prize for painting. One of the first show I made was of Julio Le Parc, who was a man who was doing optical art, but very much interactive. 
and um, it so happened that he had the prize at the Biennale de Venise. Yes, so immediately anything who was an official structure came along to Indica to have a look and, and even to buy. Yes, so it, it, everything built up very quickly and very easily, I must say. This guy came into the gallery and he goes, Hello, I'm a big American collector. <laughs> Oh, John really? said, <laughs> I'm a little English art dealer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it such a strange introduction. And, uh, you know, he immediately bought something and I kind of sold it to him. And then, you know, I got into terrible trouble from Denis René going, you know, he won the prize, you know, that should have three times or whatever, you know, instead of $1,000, it should have been $5,000 and all this. So that was, the, I think, the first big thing we sold. Yeah, yeah. A visitor to the gallery, who was even less commercially minded than Miles and John Dunbar, was Gustav Metzger. Metzger was interested in destruction and was best known for his performance on London's South Bank, where he burned a sheet of nylon with acid. I know you've deceived me, now here's a surprise. Metzger is opposed to the idea of artists as celebrities and prefers not to show his face to the camera. As a child, destruction was so uh, uh, obvious in front of me in relation to us being Jews who were, I mean, who were kind of separated for destruction. Metzger's background was central to his work. A German Jewish refugee whose parents died in the camps, he had come to England in 1939, age 12, on the Kinder transport. And why did you want to make art about destruction? Uh, as, as a response to all that, as a response and uh, to some extent as a rejection of all that, but also as a means of understanding all that. Autodestructive art. Autodestructive art reenacts the obsession with destruction, the pummeling to which individuals and masses are subjected. Autodestructive art is an attack on capitalist values and the drive to nuclear annihilation. I know you've deceived me, now here's a surprise. I know that you have, cause there's magic in my eyes. Metzger was ideologically opposed to commercial galleries, unlike his fellow underground artist, The Boyles, a husband and wife team who were the second show at Indica in the summer of 66. Working with ideas of chance and randomness, they threw a carpenter's right angle. Wherever it landed became the bottom left-hand corner of the painting, which would be an exact replica of the place where it had fallen. We had suddenly, accidentally, come up, although it fitted in with the program we were going in anyway, we had come upon the idea that the world, unconstrained by human invention, was actually a pretty good place. We just want to find a way of eliminating ourselves and being as truthful as we can about what we found in that place. People really couldn't bear that idea, really. And they kind of, you must have chosen it, do you know what I mean? But the whole point being Mark's whole thing is that, you know, it's all great. <laughs> you know, and you stick a bit of on the, on the wall and it's, a, you know, it's fabulous, uh, a fabulous picture. They did Camber Sands, which is really nice, because it's just in one spot. So every time the tide comes in and out, it completely changes it. Yeah, it's a beautiful series. So they were there a week and got, you know, each two tides, I think it is a day. And so you've got, you know, 14 really nice sandy pictures. The Boyles now call themselves Boyle Family and are still pursuing their project Nowadays, in collaboration with their adult children, Sebastian and Georgia. Metzger, in contrast, was struggling with feelings of loneliness. I think I was getting rather isolated and 
I felt, I think, the need to join with others in something. In mid-66, Metzger decided to organise a gathering that would bring together an international group of artists all working with destruction. He called it DIAS, D-I-A-S, the Destruction in Art Symposium. I put it together on a piece of paper, which is the first press release, which says that the Destruction in Art Symposium will take place in September 1966. And a month after the Indica show, um, Gustav Metzger invited you to take part in the Destruction in Art Symposium. Can you tell me about that? Mark, you take it. Yeah, well, um, we seized the opportunity to put on a piece that we'd been wanting to do for some time. It was called Sonny Lumia for insects, reptiles and water creatures. The point for us was that all life uh, depends on destruction. Another artist invited to take part in Dias was John Latham. At the time, Latham was constructing towers of books he called scoobs, a word which was books spelt backwards. He had recently begun torching and burning them. There was no book that wasn't fit to be treated because I felt that they were in fact being honoured by being made into sculpture and whatever torture they'd had was everybody's torture. Controversially at Dias, Latham set fire to three towers of books that he installed on the pavement in central London. Did you like that work? I I don't know about that. The, this committee felt, I think, that if he was going to do it, he should uh, inform the authorities. Well, he didn't accept our point of view, and he did it his way. Sure enough, along came a big fire engine and wheeled out its hose and put out Number one, first. It wasn't doing any damage, it was just burning away on the pavement. And I said, light the number three, which was a wide book with very thin pages so that it would burn quickly. And it was called Metropolitan Seminars in Art. Not a terribly good book. The fireman but suddenly had their attention drawn to across the street. Oh, another one! And the police had arrived by that time. John sort of dressed up. I think he thought that he was disguising himself as a businessman, but with his hair out here and a sort of black hat and everything, it was so obvious that it was this was not a businessman. But anyway, they, they did the whole uh, thing of burning the tower and everything, and there's some films of that, you know. Um, so the laws of England. Yes, the, it was the laws of England, you see, also. The tower. The, the tower was called the laws of England, which was being burned. We were very much seen as the anarchists out to destroy the system. It was actually actively suppressed both by the art establishment and the government. One of the Dias committee members was critic Mario Amaya. Amaya was insistent that Metzger must invite a fantastic artist he'd just discovered in New York. Her name was Yoko Ono. Anyone who is interested could come up on the stage and try to fly off from these stars. That was an interesting going. I thought that New York was the center of the world at the time. <laughs> but uh, because of the Destruction Arts Symposium and they invited me, I thought, why not? And my Ah, and my private life, in my private life, my marriage was going, walk. <laughs> so I thought, well, why not? <laughs> yeah. I was thinking of just going alone. <laughs> and my then husband said, well, we're all going. I said, oh, all right. 
Yoko was going to be in our house. Well, there was a big sort of takeover by um, Yoko in our house. I mean, I've been friendly with her for a long time and, you know, she's been wonderful and sent things like carry on trucking Barbara, you know, which is, she's our patron. <laughs> She, well, anyway, we, we, so um, she was staying in our house, and at the time she was married to Tony Cox, but I think it was kind of breaking up. On the 28th of September 1966, as part of Dias, Yoko Ono performed bag piece with her husband, Tony Cox. It was a bag piece, a piece of mine, and then it could have been anybody who gets in there, but it happens to be Tony Cox. He was my husband, so, you know, it, it was simpler to do it with him, probably. Actually, you could imagine that somebody's having sex in there. I mean, that's all to do with your interpretation. Or you could be, you know, you could imagine that they're sort of praying together or something. But there's a certain movement that's going on. And to create that movement, I usually ask the, the person uh, with me inside the bag to take uh, uh, the person's clothes off and then put it on again. And these days, I don't do that or anything. Just take a jacket and shirt off, that's enough. <laughs> because it just gets so convoluted or too long, you know. Tony Cox was on the phone all the time publicizing Yoko, which I mean, obviously, you know, that is what perhaps Americans do. That's what was done, which none of us were doing sort of so well. Would you say you were, you were sort of strategic in that way? Not at all. <laughs> I was surprised, you know, that I got that sort of publicity. But I always did in a way. I mean, uh, uh, I mean um, in, um, in the States as well and in Japan as well. Um, quite often it was not, um, not a favorable one. The key works were two evenings of the cut piece presentation at Africa Center. Both were so packed out, there were people wanting tickets, couldn't get them. I mean, by that time, she had got a lot of publicity in London papers about herself and her work. Cut piece is one of Yoko's seminal works. She sat on stage with a large pair of scissors next to her and invited strangers from the audience to come on stage one by one and cut off a section of her clothing. When I did the cut piece, I was feeling a little bit scared once I was on the stage. Being a woman and being that part, that person, Who's, who has to go through that in life, about people cutting your clothes wherever they want. <laughs> it was sort of like um, biographical, that that is what I allow the world to do to me, but also that is what the world does to me. It's very delicate, it might take some time. <laughs> John? I was there, yeah. What yeah, do you, what do you, what do you... I cut a piece off. <laughs> I cut a piece off a revealing portion of the anatomy. But it um, didn't get down to bedrock. No, I didn't do any cutting. I don't think I cut a piece of her clothes off. No. The other artists felt that I was not destructive at all. So they went to Gustav Metzger and said, oh, you have to kick out the girl, because she's, what she's doing is not destructive. <laughs> it was so amazing. Yeah. But I wasn't kicked out, though. Gustav was very, well, you know, he was intelligent. <laughs> Far more extreme than Yoko Ono 
were the Austrian actionists. They performed violent and provocative actions, which in origin were designed to shock the complacent post-war Austrian bourgeoisie. You have to go a bit further to wake people up. You have to shake people up a little more. If I do an action, I don't like it when people clap for my actions. That's something, I must have done something wrong if people clap. Otherwise, it's nothing new. They have to be surprised or shocked and say, that's terrible, that's outrageous. I used um, people and food, eggs, jam, fruit juice, flour, those sort of things. In, in Austria, it was a very particular thing because of hunger. Hunger in Austria had been a big thing, and it, it, I made fun about it, and it was something that was pe offended people in Austria. So it was provocative because it had a particular mean. It wasn't being eaten, but it was being just spread over a body. So jam put in the face, uh, margarine, so on. Did you intend to frighten people? Wolltest du die Leute Angst machen? New things always make people that, who live in the past get frightened to buy things, new things. I thought it was beautiful what I did. That it made people afraid. But when Hitler came, no one was afraid when Hitler came. They all went with him, they all went with him to destruction, the idiots. And then they were afraid of actionism. Isn't that stupid? Isn't that a bit weird? It's peculiar. People are like that in Austria and Germany. It's terrible. And even up to today, they're still like that. At Dias, Mool performed an action called Ten Rounds for Cassius Clay. This obscure title in no way prepared the audience for the disturbing spectacle they were about to see. I can hardly remember it now. I think there was material there. I think there was breathing there as well. It all went. I've done so many actions. Well, I can, I can remind you, because I know there was, a, there was a naked woman, uh -huh. and then you were um, scattering all sorts of different du hast things onto her. And that was what I usually did. Das war normal. <laughs> that was normal. <laughs> what was he doing to those women? Was he defiling them or abusing them or...? I think it was a combination of, of all, and that was the magic of it. It, it was a, a, a total statement about himself. A very complex person, no doubt, a very interesting person. And so I think he wanted to sort of create the world in one evening. And that was one reason it was so profound. It showed the courage and it showed also dominance that he kind of subjected them. It was part of he, he expressed his aggression uh, and his violence in Persil. I mean, who would use Persil on a naked skin? Uh, he did. And do you still do actions? It is an action. I, I'm, do, I'm doing action again. Luckily, I have my teeth and I, I take them out like that. Mm. 
One of Moore's fellow actionists at Dias, whose work was even more frightening, was Herman Nitsch. Nitsch worked with animals and with blood. His Dias performance took place in a community hall near St Paul's Cathedral. We would have had clear message in, on paper, I need buckets of blood, I need an animal, I need... and we managed to get that. And the event took place. At the centre of it all, there was a, an, an animal, a dead animal, lamb. It would have been a lamb. It was done, it was an event. Obviously, for some people, rather harrowing and emotional. And that was that. It was a provocative act by Nietzsche to, to crucify sheep. And he meant it seriously. I think he was religious, but I'm not, I'm, I want nothing to do with religion. Yeah, not even when I need help. Uh, he, I was a friend and I helped him, but I don't identify with him. I help him as a friend. I was very impressed with that work. I felt outdone and outdistanced. We were very kind of timid compared with the, the Viennese. They got up to all kinds of things which terrified me. I mean, um, you had the feeling that they were, they were almost psychotic. After it ended, we saw two policemen come in through the entrance and, and most of the people had gone and they started asking questions. And that was the start of a long series of investigations and uh, hearings and finally a court case in the July of the following year. Nietzsche's action was deemed obscene and Metzger was fined £100. Metzger was sentenced only three weeks after Mick Jagger and Fraser were convicted for drugs offences. The authorities by now were determined to clamp down on all activities that challenge social norms. People used to fund those meat fests rather very cathartic. They used to come out of them jubilant, having rolled around in blood and shit with nothing on and the psychotherapy seemed obvious, <laughs> you know. The impact of Dias on the London scene was far-reaching. Within six months of attending the symposium, British artist Stuart Brisley had turned away from painting and was performing his own startlingly visceral actions. Pete Townsend of The Who was making auto-destructive music. Dias was also the main cultural event featured in the launch issue of IT, London's first underground newspaper. IT was set up by Miles and a group of his friends and was based at the Indica Bookshop. For the first time, it brought together the disparate artists and writers who had been working away trying to establish a counterculture. It's so far out. It's straight down. What they want, what were wanted was the English equivalent of East Village Other, of an underground newspaper. Because nobody can think of a name, we call it It. And then you worked out from it what that could stand for, so it was International Times. Were you making any money? I'm sure not. <laughs> I don't think we had any idea how to make money, even if we wanted to. Drawn into this scene was Yoko Ono. Still in London a few weeks after Dias, she made her way to the Indica Gallery and asked for an exhibition. How did she come to have a show at Indica? Um, she came round to the gallery and, and said, would I give her a show? Had you heard of her at that point? 
Yeah, sort of. I mean, through the... Um, because of the autodestructive symposium thing. And she wanted to, to, to set something uh, conceptual, mostly and, uh, with ideas uh, coming from Duchamp that were not of our generation, really, because she was still young. Yes? Like uh, Cage or Duchamp were, could have been fathers or grandfathers to her. Fathers, mostly, yes? Did you already know her work, then? Well, uh, we, we knew it on the spot. And what was Yoko like? Cause... Well, sort of quiet and Yoko and, you know, very you know, sort of strong no, and powerful personality. What? Quiet? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, compared to... Well, it was compared to Anthony. <laughs> oh, yes, well, indeed, that's <laughs> true. You know, because he was true. so kind of hysterical. Yeah. I knew her because she was married to Tony Cox then. I didn't know her very well. But that was that very New York... I wasn't very keen on that very New York, very avant-garde, you know, serious, precious. Wasn't my idea of fun. Very straight, very hard, with targets uh, in the eyes. I remember Yoko's exhibition. I remember her doing it. Tell me about that. Well, it was all very particular and it was white and all the rest of it. This is called a ceiling painting. When you look at it with this, you see it says yes. And um, actually I was thinking that this ladder should be very, very, very high, you know, where the ceiling is like a, a church ceiling. And then you go on climbing up and climbing up, and then you finally see that uh, some sign there, and it says yes. You know, that was the idea, really. This is called a wrapping object. And uh, the object is uh, just something that should be wrapped. And it goes on being wrapped, you see. And uh, so this can go on growing. It's a piece that goes, goes on growing. And it's just, I just feel very nice about it. We have this in the museum. In 10 years' time, it will be so huge, you can't take out the room, you know. And then you must, maybe you have to uh, uh, take off the ceiling and so forth, you know, it just goes so growing. Yoko's exhibition opened on the 9th of November 1966. This date has gone down in history. It was the day that Yoko Ono met John Lennon. All I know is the fact that John, John Dumber, uh, just opened the door and, and came in with another guy, you know, and I was sort of surprised because John was extremely sympathetic to artists, I mean John Dumber, and I told him that I didn't want anybody there until I'm totally prepared and at the opening, and it was before that, and you know, he just came in with him, with a guy, and I thought, oh, what is, uh, what is he doing, you know? But then I thought, well, <clears throat> Might be a good friend or something. I shouldn't make a thing out of it, you know. Now that they came in, you know. that's how it was. So, what do you remember about that day, John? God, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's kind of hard to know what I remember from that day and what people have, you know, been talking about for years, you know, since and sort of put on top of it. Um, you know, it was. Just, I told John to come around because he'd like it, and you know, and he did, and he did, and uh, you know, spent an hour or two there, and uh, you know, that was that. And um, Yoko obviously liked him. Yes, and claimed I never to have heard of the Beatles and all that sort of business, um, and you know, who knows? <laughs> well, actually, Yoko had already approached Paul McCartney for manuscripts, Beatles manuscripts, for the to give to uh, the John Cage collection of contemporary manuscripts at uh, Lincoln Centre. So she certainly knew who the Beatles were. Right, OK, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you have documentary well, evidence. So there. <laughs> First they went downstairs, and I didn't go downstairs with them. They just sort of went downstairs. And I thought, well, I should pull and see what they're doing. I went down, and then John started to talk to me. And I looked at him and said, what a beautiful you know, sort of attractive guy. And I was totally amazed about that. My, my memory, actually, is that she tried to get in the car with him when he left. 
Oh, wow, you've got a whole kind of another take. Well, it, yeah, yeah, but again, you see, I may not, I don't know where I've got that from, but I remember her sort of definitely sort of linking arms with him as they were going round and she was pointing out stuff, and then she made quite a strong effort to leave with him, even though Tony was there and everything. The gallery was very quiet, and uh, he asked what was that apple on the stand, and uh, Yoko had a very good speech, you know? She could uh, <laughs> uh, seduce with her speech, and she did. Uh, people wouldn't wait until this crumples, you see. People are not that patient, so they like to eat it, you know, <laughs> or they like to steal it. <laughs> I mean, John is the only one who did something like that, which was to bite the apple. <laughs> and I, I was very upset about that, actually, at the time. <laughs> How dare he? <laughs> this was John and Yoko's highly significant first meeting, although it wasn't until 18 months later that they publicly became a couple. For the time being, Yoko remained married to Tony Cox, who helped organise her next major piece in Trafalgar Square. This was called lion wrapping and was an echo of the chair wrapping she had shown at Indica. Well, first when I tried it once um, at the time of Indica Gallery Show and it didn't work at all because uh, we only had toilet papers or something. <laughs> and it was just, and it was raining, so it was just sort of blown in the wind kind of thing. And also we didn't have a permission. So the cops, you know, said, oh, you can't do this here. So, so it didn't work out. Right Next time when we did it, I was well prepared. We got a permission from the, uh, the, the department, whatever department was, and uh, made sure that we had huge cloth. Even that, it took ten time because, you know, the line's so big. This collaboration did nothing to heal the rift between Yoko and her husband, and they split up not long after. In late 66, John Dunbar was having domestic problems of his own, which were coming between him and his gallery. Would John be there every day? Yeah, he, he liked to come very much, but there, it was also a period where he started to have uh, family problems. Their apartment actually was had this extraordinary contrast, didn't it? There was, they did, uh, yes. <laughs> Marianne, <laughs> using her as a rock and roll money, had, had done it up with very, you know, very fancy, lovely sort of dining room table and yeah. the cut glass, you know, glasses and silverware and stuff. And then so in the living room, there'd be all of John's scroungy friends like me and everybody. We'd, we'd all be sitting on the floor sort of banging on pots and pans, you know, and smoking no, we had, dope yeah, and yeah, so, I mean, and John and, then and, in the back, and Paul McCartney be, and stuff. And then yeah. we'd, yeah, we'd come and then back. And then in the back, though, there, would be, there would be Marianne with her mother and everything and the yeah. nanny and, yeah. uh, and, and the, the baby, whole other very so. straight middle-class thing sort of happening. And uh, it was like two worlds, you know, and you separated by the corridor. completely doomed all this this period of domesticity I wanted a sort of straight bourgeois marriage you know and I'd certainly picked the wrong person for that I think Nicholas was about a year old or a bit older and I just had enough I just couldn't go on Marianne decided to leave and began a relationship with Mick Jagger leaving John with baby Nicholas Love is When I split up from Marianne for a while, I kind of actually stayed at the gallery. I sort of slept there for something, you know, I don't know, a few, a couple of weeks or something. And John was looking after his baby alone. He was looking after Nicholas alone. That was, the, the period was very difficult for him to live, you know. It is difficult to be, uh, at the time, uh, the, uh, married to Marianne, have a kid and uh, see your wife go with someone else. Despite John's domestic problems, shows at the gallery continued.
In March 67, avant-garde kinetic artist David Medalla showed there. Nowadays, Medalla is a performance artist and stages impromptu events. Chu Wang Chu and the Butterfly Dream. Chu Wang Chu and the Butterfly Dream. And in the car, we proposed to make foam sculptures. They consisted of tall stand, and in that tall stand, I would put um, a bucket with water and uh, soap. And after half an hour or one hour or two hours after I had opened the gallery, the foam would come out of the stand and start making big uh, lines. I would open the door, it would invade the courtyard. <laughs> and, and, and it was a sort of art which no one had seen. It was for the pleasure of people who came. It was very wet <laughs> after a while. <laughs> having already given rise to IT, now spawned its own underground nightclub. The Pink Floyd, once called the Underground's House Orchestra. On Friday nights, they and other groups play at UFO, U-F-O, an identified flying object, a nighttime environment where films, projection and music make the Underground's nightclub a huge entertainment scene. all night long and there was uh, music concert dancing and there was dealing of one kind or another substances of one kind or another and there was a there was a kind of souk like marketplace of things that then IT was sold there of course so it was a really sort of pretty wild I mean, I, I had a friend who lived up the road who used to say that Saturday morning, when he lay in bed, it sounded like an alpine meadow with these bells going past. <laughs> Final lot leaving, there'll be tinkly, tinkly, tinkly. It's a bit like I heard of goats going up the road. You know, and the police were pretty benign and they'd bring back, you know, fairly out of their head people and say, I think this is one of yours, and <laughs> give them back to us. And the first band were the Pink Floyd and the Soft Machine. And, and, and light shows began there, and Mark Boyle's light show began in the, in the uh, in UFO. He was making light shows, yes, that were very much appreciated and which no one had ever seen things like that before. We started experimenting with projecting strange liquids and bottles of things we stuck together. And as they got hot, they would start to move. And so we then got more chemical reactions and we worked with that. Your lights are very psychedelic. And people watching might assume that you were into psychedelia. Were you, were you, were you part of that sort of uh, rock and roll drugs world? No, because as painters, um, we decided how could we trust our own judgment if we took drugs. And so we thought it's all right for other people to do whatever they like, but perhaps we'll do LSD at 80, but we haven't done it yet. LSD is 80. Woo. You're not 80 yet, are you? No, nor are you. Nineteen sixty seven was the apogee of London's hippie moment. Psychedelia and flower power were in. The campaign to legalize pot was at its height, and the hippie slogan was make love, not war. <laughs> I, I really wish the people 
that, that look sort of with anger at, at the weirdos, at the happenings, at the psychedelic freakout, would instead of just looking with anger, just look with nothing, with no feeling, you know, be unbiased about it. Because they really don't realize that what these people are talking about is something that they really want themselves. It's something that everyone wants. You know, it's personal freedom to be able to talk and be able to say things. And it's dead straight. It's a real sort of basic pleasure for everyone. But it looks weird from the outside. After all the jets are in the boxes. In April of that year, at London's Alexandra Palace, the entire moment came together at the 14-hour Technicolor Dream, Britain's biggest ever hippie happening. What would you describe as the purpose of this evening, the 14-hour Technicolor Dream? Oh, uh, well, uh, I think that uh, there's a new period. We're starting a new era. Uh, sweeping around as a kind of reaction to uh, various things that have been happening in the world. And it's, um, it makes itself manifest itself in love and sweetness and kindness and flowers. What, for instance, is beautiful about you? What's beautiful about me? Oh, um, <laughs> oh uh, well, I, I don't know. I'm very loving and very giving, and uh, I don't know. I think that's beautiful. This was a fundraising event for IT and a protest against censorship and police repression. The event brought together everyone from the underground. Yoko Ono, David Medalla and the Boyles all performed there. They said to me, oh look David, could you do something for it? And lots of people are doing things for it. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do a dance for you. And it, it began with me dancing. So that was how it began. an extraordinary experience um, because there were so many bands uh, and because Alexandra Palace was so large we had a stage at each end so there was actually a point in the middle where you could get an extraordinary stereo effect of uh, two bands simultaneously and then there were all the usual uh, sort of hippie fad things you know at that point that was the, like the two weeks when when smoking banana peelings um, was in as the as a way of getting high so there was a sort of igloo there with the Susie cream cheese in there dispensing um, bananas. <laughs> My name is Susie Cream Cheese. All you can do is dig it and give something prettier to the world that's so bloody worried about everything. Prettier than war. Prettier than wars and blood and death and income tax. Did you go to that? Mm, I helped organise it. Right. Do you remember me there? Mm-hmm. Right. You were there with John Lennon. <laughs> I know, but we'd just taken some a lot. We'd taken a big lot of acid, so the whole thing was kind of like really, yeah, you know, kind of, and it was kind of weird because I was with John. You know, people would come out of the woodwork, and like there was people I sort of, you know, hadn't seen since kind of uh, kindergarten school, <laughs> sort of coming out. It was a very weird evening. Yoko directed Cut Piece that night, using a model as the central figure instead of her own body. The performance was watched by a fascinated John Lennon. A year later, he and Yoko would become a couple. Technical Dream was very much sort of maybe the biggest hippie event in, that Britain ever experienced. Um, you could say it sort of all began with the Albert Hall reading in 65, summer of 65, and pretty much ended with the 14 hour Technical Dream in whenever that was, the end of 67.
afterwards, um, I remember there was uh, part of the entertainment had been these enormous sort of six foot long paper paper mache joints that were part of a, the props from somebody or other, and uh, there were a whole bunch of skinheads and mods who took them outside and like smashed them all to pieces. So it was sort of <laughs> you could say it was a portent of things to come. So. It was still only the spring of 67, but the writing was already on the wall. Without anyone quite being aware of it, the hippie revolution had become an unrealizable dream. Only three years after it opened, the Indica Gallery and Bookshop closed down, reflecting the end of an era. We got to that stage where, you know, it was, I really had to sort of turn into a business. And, you know, which was, I didn't really like, I'd bust up with Marianne, so the kind of point of it was because I had a kid and, you know, I was for that really, you know, otherwise, you know, I wouldn't have had a shop. The sort of, you know, so the kind of, uh, you know, motivation had sort of gone and, yeah. And what did you do when the gallery closed? And also it was very difficult, you know, it got to be very difficult financially, basically, as I was saying, I really had to sort of do business or not, you know, and I kind of did not. <laughs> it's all so long ago. <laughs> John Dunbar is now an artist and Miles writes books that chronicle the 60s. Gustav Metzger still has no gallery, and Otto Mool ended up in prison for sex offences. <laughs> Yoko Ono continues her work as an artist, and in her 70th year, restaged cut piece. Please lock me away And don't allow the day Here inside where I hide with my loneliness I don't care what they say I won't stay in a world without love Birds sing out of tune And rain clouds hide the moon I'm okay, here I'll stay With my loneliness I don't care what they say I won't stay in a world without love 